Before we uh, begin our afternoon session, um, we have a couple of uh, short videos uh, we'd like to present uh, for you before we uh, begin our uh, family story. Uh, one is from uh, Columbus Division of Fire, and then one is from uh, Ohio Health. So if we can start those. Fleischman, cardiologist at Grant Medical Center. I'd like to take this time to recognize and thank EMS for all you've done and continue to do to take care of our patients every day in our community. We could not provide the care that we do at our hospitals without the support of your team. The impact you have across the continuum of care is priceless. Again, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Vincent Yates. I'm the president at Ohio Health Mansfield and Ohio Health Shelby Hospitals. I want to thank you all for the work that you do each and every day to meet our mission of improving the health of those we serve. EMS week is an incredibly important time. I get the great fortune of seeing what the folks do each and every day. In our area, uh, we're blessed that they cover about an eight county region. And when they're bringing these folks into our ERs, the work that they do is incredible. We're now out there into uh, the schools and with EMS making a difference in terms of differing programs so that our younger folks are being educated in terms of what to do related to bleeding, other aspects. So again, thank you very much. We hope you have a great week and we're very appreciative of everything you do each and every day to service the patients of Ohio. Thank you. My name is Allison Decker. I'm the EMS coordinator at Ohio Health Grady Memorial Hospital and Ohio Health Lewis Center Freestanding ER. I just want to say thank you to EMS. They provide all the pre-hospital care for our patients and we couldn't do what we do if it wasn't for the care that you guys do prior to bringing them into our facilities. So thank you. I'm Dr. David Keswick, the Medical Director for the Columbus Division of Fire. And I'm Kevin O'Connor, Fire Chief for the Columbus Division of Fire. 1,000 Americans die every day from sudden cardiac arrest, but many of these deaths would be prevented if CPR was initiated in the first few seconds after a cardiac arrest. Columbus's EMS system has one of the highest survival rates for sudden cardiac arrest in the country. Here are two things you can do to help save a life. Immediately perform hands-only CPR on anyone who is unconscious and pulseless. Make yourself aware of a cardiac arrest near you by downloading the Pulse Point app on your smartphone. This app will automatically notify you of any cardiac arrest within 300 yards of your location. We need your help. Please join us as we work to save as many lives in Columbus as possible from cardiac arrest. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed the videos. This is a great section. This is uh, called a family story. And uh, I wanted to go back about a year ago, a little more than that. On March 
5th, 2018, Randy Bates I was at the Blarney Stone Tavern in Worthington, and it was league night, and as with most Monday evenings, Randy joined his team to compete against some of Central Ohio's best pool players. During one of the night's matches, Randy approached the team captain, who happened to be Randy's son, Adam Bates, and they discussed strategy and current team point totals. After their brief conversation, Randy turned around and started back to the pool table when he collapsed to the floor. Quick to act were Jeff McClune and Benny King, both members of another team, who immediately jumped to Randy's aid. Jeff and Benny had once been volunteer firefighters. They assessed Randy, recognized his heart was not beating, initiated CPR, and instructed Adam to call 911. Worthington Fire was dispatched immediately to the scene. At 8.30 p.m., the first EMS provider, Battalion Chief Pat Mulligan, came just behind him with the crew of Medic 101. Chief Mulligan confirmed that Randy did not have a pulse, relieved Jeff and Benny, and continued CPR. He alerted the crew of Medic 101 that this was indeed a cardiac arrest. Paramedics Clayton Miller and Kevin McKelvey and Michael Snyder assisted Chief Mulligan. Defibrillation pads were placed, IV access was established, and respirations were given by bag valve mask. Randy's heart rhythm was identified as ventricular fibrillation. A shock at 200 joules was delivered immediately, and compressions were resumed, and one milligram of epinephrine was pushed. The crew's reassessment revealed that he had ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. Randy's pulse was strong, but quickly his heart rate increased and he was back in V-fib. A second shock was delivered, and again, CPR was reinitiated. Randy was successfully intubated, and ROSC was achieved for a second time. Randy began to breathe on his own. Fighting against them, the crew decided that Randy uh, needed to be given five milligrams of Versed for this. The crew's auto pulse was initiated, and Randy was moved to Medic 101 for transport. Paramedics Tom Heinemann and Chris Dawson from Engine 101 joined Medic 101's crew to assist them. En route to Riverside Methodist, Randy's condition again deteriorated, and for another time he was back in ventricular fibrillation. The team resumed CPR, epinephrine was administered, and a third defibrillation was delivered. An interosseous line was established through the tibia, and fluids were initiated. A third round of epinephrine was given, as was sodium bicarbonate, and D10 was started through the IO line. As they pulled up to Riverside Methodist ED, the next rhythm check was strong, fast, carotid pulse. This was at 8.50 p.m., 20 minutes after Chief Mulligan had first arrived on the scene. Amazing time. Randy was evaluated by the ED staff and was taken immediately to the cath lab. His heart catheterization demonstrated a 50% ejection fraction with evidence of fluid overload and cardiogenic shock. An impella ventricular assist device was implanted into his left ventricle to allow his heart to rest and to heal. On March 14th, Randy underwent surgery for a quadruple bypass. We are incredibly pleased to have Randy Bates here with us today. Randy, would you please join us on stage? Randy, thanks so much for being here with us. We're honored. Would those here from Worthington Fire Department please join us on stage at this time? Randy, can you tell us what you remember from that date and what these guys from Worthington EMS did for you? What I remember, oh, I'm sorry. What I remember or what I was told afterwards. <laughs> Either will work. Okay, uh, for the actual memory, there was none. Um, I was told afterwards about how the uh, two gentlemen from the other team were instrumental in making, me, making it possible for me to be here today. And then these guys followed up with some great uh, efforts with the shocking. And uh, everybody at the hospital, I have to also give credit for doing an excellent job. 
from doctors to nurses because I was very well cared for. And for whatever reason, uh, somebody has chosen to leave me on this earth. God bless you. Unfortunately, Dr. Arshi, the interventional cardiologist who performed your catheterization, could not make it here today. However, uh, his colleague, Dr. Michael Jolly, has graciously offered to speak to us about your procedure and clinical findings. Dr. Jolly? Okay, um, I think I have a slide advancer here, so I'm gonna, it's down here. Let's see if I can advance this slide. How do I advance? Mm -hmm. Somebody? Okay, here we go. Maybe I'm going through your slides here. I think this was his initial EKG. Um, immediately following his Rossi, it was obtained from you guys coming in. You know, as all you recognize, this is a very concerning EKG. So when we see this in the setting of something having sudden cardiac death, this is, this is cardiac, this is STEMI, this is, this is something that needs an angiogram. Um, that is the de facto way to make a diagnosis. This patient needs to come straight to the cath lab. And a viable patient like him who was playing pool literally 20 minutes beforehand is someone, uh, we, we grease those wheels pretty quickly to get them to our lab to see if there's something we can do open a coronary, support their left ventricle, whatever needs to be done. This is his right coronary artery to kind of reorient you. Um, this catheter has probably been inserted from his wrist. Um, we take a little thin, flexible plastic tube, looks like a long straw, really, and they all have little preformed curves on them to sit kind of into the natural coronary arteries. This is a right coronary artery. It uh, kind of provides blood flow to the bottom of the heart. This is why the right coronary artery gives you that inferior stimmy when it shuts down. This is a very diseased vessel, but it's not an occluded vessel. There is flow through it. Um, it gives the entirety of his, uh, what we call the posterior descending artery, um, and it's open. So this is just a different angle. We kind of look at this coronary artery. We know this isn't the, this isn't the culprit. We're looking for a culprit. We're looking for a thrombus, a big blood clot that we can either suck out, put a stent in, open up the vessel with. Um, and this is his left circumflex uh, towards the bottom of the screen, kind of writing up on the top is his LED. Um, this also has flow, it's open. This is a great sign for us, um, but it has a lot of disease. There's a lot of areas of this, and you can kind of see how curvy, or we call tortuous, the circumflex is. These are not very favorable for stenting. Um, different angles of the LED. The LED is the culprit here, and right in the middle part of the LED, I really can't point um, very easily, but for those of you who can see, right in the middle of this LED is what the culprit is. That was a ruptured plaque that happened while you were playing pool. This vessel shut down and went, caused you to go into ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is not really a rhythm most of us can get out of without electricity, so that's the in, importance of the defibrillator. Um, Go to the next slide. When we see um, flow in all the vessels, but disease that looks like this, this is a great time to call a surgeon like Dr. Inlow into the uh, into the operating into the cath lab, because the best way to really revascularize this heart is with bypass. Um, he can lay down four or even five bypass grafts. Um, in a much quicker time frame, honestly, than we can lay in the seven, eight, ten stents that would be required and would a much better result with surgical bypass. What we do in this situation in the cath lab, however, is support the left ventricle. The reason he is now in recurrent ventricular fibrillation is because his heart is in such acute failure. Uh, it's not pumping uh, very well. Um, it's pumping pseudo-okay because of the epinephrine but um, his heart is, is, is in shock, um, his blood pressure is low, and this is an impella device. An impella device is called impella because it has an impeller motor inside of it. So this is a miniaturized motor which basically sucks blood from the failing ventricle and, and through its motor ejects it out into the aorta. It basically takes some of the work, not all of the work, but some of the work of the beating heart off of the heart. 
So it allows us to diurese these patients. It allows us to uh, get their lungs working again. It allows their heart to recover. Um, it allows us time to get him neurologically, if, if that's a concern, into a place where we can perhaps take him to the operating room or, or perform a high-risk stenting procedure on him. So that was done as a stopgap to kind of get him to the next step. The impella device um, is inserted through the right common or the left common femoral artery, generally speaking, and this can give us, like I said, about half of the work of the heart, what we need here. Um, the rest of it really does still kind of depend on him. And in, in his case, this was the place where we stopped in the cath lab. We get his heart supported, we get him to the ICU, we get him to cool off, as it were. We get Dr. Enlow's team involved to see um, what, uh, what uh, bypass options look like for him. And that's kind of, I think, where we go from here. Do you want Dr. Enlow to come up and? I can introduce Dr. John Enlow. Dr. John Enlow is one of you, actually. Um, he got his start, John, correct me if I'm wrong, as a paramedic in Southern Ohio. Um, and so um, he made his way uh, through, uh, through the uh, old education up into, uh, I think he did his training at Riverside in South Carolina for cardiac surgery. And um, so John's one of our, uh, our cardiac surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons at Riverside and who, uh, who uh, helped us out with this case. John. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having us. Um, let me see. Okay, so <clears throat> Mr. Bates here um, didn't wake up immediately, you know, so there's a whole protocol um, that once the patient leaves the cath lab, um, he's safely supported. Um, you know, in his case, um, he might have lost a couple pounds since the last time I've seen him, but. Uh, he was right on the cusp where that impella device that was put in, the impella CP, um, it can flow about three and a half uh, liters a minute of blood flow. And, um, you know, I was a little worried for him whether that was going to be an adequate um, a support device for him, uh, given his body size and the, you know, overall probably would need, you know, five and a half liters of cardiac output per minute. So. Yeah, but it, he did well on the CP, so we didn't have to upsize. So, you know, at Riverside, we do have um, other options than the impella that um, was placed up there, um, the impella CP, if we could put a, surgically place a uh, impella 5.0, um, put them on ECMO. Um, so we have a lot of options once we've determined that, you know, the, that um, there's adequate blood flow down all the coronary and, um, arteries. Um, you know, a common question is always, well, why didn't you take him to the operating room right then and there? You know, you know time is muscle, and um, the, the outcomes for people are pretty poor if you take them emergently for uh, bypass surgery if they're having a STEMI. Um, we certainly do it, especially if maybe there's a lot of calcific disease and the cardiologist can't get through and get the culprit um, closure um, open. but our guys are pretty good. They get in and get most things uh, uh, centered open. But occasionally we do have to take people. But um, you can have a really uh, a big reaction to the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit um, and even just the restoration of blood flow to that um, ischemic muscle can cause problems. So um, we, if we have our druthers, we would like um, to let the patient, you know, get supported with the device, diurese them, get the pressures in the heart down and then um, be able to do some other tests. To, we know that a bypass operation would be, be safe. So we, I removed the impella device um, after we determined that it was time to come out and repaired his uh, femoral artery and his groin. Then I put him back in the ICU. And then a couple days after that, took him for a quadruple bypass. Um, my team's down there um, that helped that day. Um, got Nicole and Abby and Blake. Um, um, we're all instrumental in the, in the process. but. Um, we did a quadruple bypass, bypassed all the uh, areas of disease, um, and um, how many days were you in the hospital after that? Uh, roughly three weeks. Okay. Yeah, that was a little bit of a long go. So, but he's done great, and, um, you know, he, uh, I think back at his three-year-and-a-half-week follow-up, he was already making plans to go to Vegas and play pool, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had to, had to slow him down a little bit, but... Um,
we thank all of you guys for being here today. It's an incredible story. And uh, we'd like to have you go out to the lobby so we can have pictures with the entire team. It's a great story. Thank you so much.